Cantor's Paradise, Zermelo Franco set theory, Aleph numbers, the actual infinity. You might be wondering what madness drove this 17 year old kid to spend his entire Christmas holiday studying and researching the mathematical nature of the actual infinity. Well, the answer is actually quite simple. When I was preparing for this TED talk, the first thing I did was go onto the TEDx website and see, well, what topics could I talk about? Well, as a Christian and someone who's quite interested in philosophy, I thought, well, wouldn't this be a great opportunity to present some philosophical arguments for the, ex the existence of God? Or perhaps I could use this time to prepare a powerful case for the historical resurrection. Yet, the moment I le looked at the rules, the first thing I saw was, well, no religious or political agenda. So, well, that had to go out of the window. Then I thought, okay, I know a bit of science. How about talk about evolution and young earth creationism and how they're kind of, there's some problems here. But then, I then saw another thing, no bad science. So, well, that had to go out of the window as well. So I was left with nothing but the actual infinity. And it's not that I'm complaining about it because it turns out the actual infinity is actually a very interesting topic, no pun intended there. And you might think, well, I'm just paid by a math teacher to tell you, oh, maths is very fun now. Let's all apply for maths for A levels. But no, the actual infinity is actually a very interesting and profound topic that has significant implications on our physical world and also the conceptual world of Platonic realism and conceptual realism. So what I would like to do here, since this topic, the actual infinity, is a massive topic, I would like to discuss its implications on the physical world and discuss whether it can actually be applied to the physical world, whether an actually infinite amount of things or quantities can be realized or actualized in our world around us, both in this temporal sense and also a spatial sense. Can the past be actually infinite and can space as a whole be actually infinite? To discuss this, I would like to turn to the use of paradoxes. The use of paradoxes has been used throughout the history of philosophy to discuss or show that something cannot happen or that some result or some argument leads to contradictory results. A good example of this would be Zeno's paradoxes, which is one of the arguments I'll be raising today, and also Grim Reaper's paradox, which I'll be also discussing in this video. So without further ado, let's get started. What is the Zeno's paradox? Well, Zeno actually raises multiple paradoxes throughout his life, which are recorded by Aristotle in his book Physics. While we don't have any direct works from Zeno, we do see a lot of his paradoxes in Aristotle's books, including the dichotomy paradox, which we'll be discussing in this video, Archimedes and the tortoise, the stadium paradox, and the arrow paradox, and others. So, what is the dichotomy paradox? While there's more responses to this paradox, I think that I love this paradox and I think it's very interesting because of its numerous variations. Not only do you have to accept the first paradox that Zeno raises, you can also discuss and develop it further to suit your needs, and that's essentially what I do. So before we get started or before we delve deeper into these second or third variations, I would like to discuss what the Zeno's paradox is and what idea it is trying to get at. So Zeno's paradox is best represented by an analogy. While Zeno uses a runner, I would like to use a painter since I coincidentally have a painting right behind me and I'm not in a museum of modern arts, I'm just in my dining room. So imagine there's this painting, a painter's trying to draw a paint painting. Well, that's what painters do. So he, in order to draw half the painting, he first has to draw a quarter of the painting and before he could draw a quarter of it, he has to draw an eighth of it, so on ad infinitum. So as you can see, there, there's this potentially, or this divisions, you could potentially divide this, so on ad infinitum towards the side you're starting to draw from. So you have half, a quarter, an eighth, and so on. And for this infinite series, I would be saying, I'll be referring to it as the Z series because that would just be easier, uh, named after Zeno. So as you can see, this goes for uh, running, for any action as well. Before you move the entire thing, you have to move half of it and the Z series. So what Zeno tries to say that it's impossible for anyone to move. Because in order to move, they first have to cross an actually infinite number of series, which is impossible. 
So what are some preliminary responses to this argument? Well, the most normal one or the most common one is raised by Aristotle in his book, The Physics. He basically writes that this series is only a potential infinite and not an actually infinite series. However, this is wrong. Because if you look at the nature of the potential infinite and the nature of the actual infinite, what we do see is that while the potential infinite is basically a number or a series of numbers going up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or any series like that, ad infinitum, the actually infinite series is an actually definite set of numbers. While some of these actually infinite series are denumerable and others are non-denumerable, what we see is an, a defined or an actually infinite set of numbers which already exist as a whole. So essentially, how do we know something is a potentially infinite or is it an actually infinite? This is what we sometimes call a one-to-one -one correspondence. You see whether one set could be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with another set. If they can, then they're equal in size. For example, if you have five loaves of bread and five fish, you put one loaf of bread with another fish, and then the second bread with a second fish, third, fourth, third, and so on like that. So you can see that five loaves of bread have the same number of the fish because they could put, be put into one-to-one -one correspondence. So as you can see, if we put the number of divisions in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers, which as we've known or Cantor discusses, is an actually infinite series, you basically have quite an interesting result. One of the natural numbers goes to one in the Z series. Two to one half three to one quarter and so on and infinitum, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So what we do see is that with these pairs, the Z series is actually an actually infinite series. And that's what Ben Ardette writes in his book or essay, Infinity. So we can see that this response that this series is a potential infinite, it doesn't really work. So what else can someone say in response to this? Well, Ben Ardette says, well, let's imagine time itself could also be divisible in this Z series. One minute could be divisible into one half, and a half to a quarter, and so on, like the Z series. Now, with that in mind, it seems that at face value, there's enough points on the finite time to correspond with the points on a finite line. So, time, the restriction of time on this crossing a fin infinite or a finite line, does not actually happen because you actually have enough time via one to one correspondence to actually paint the entire painting or run the entire distance. So what can we say to this? I'll raise variation two of the Zeno's paradox. Imagine you have a log and a metaphysical knife which you cut to exact precision to whatever you want to cut. You have log, you cut half a quarter like the Z series. Now, assuming that Bernardet's paradox works, it does seem that you will cut towards the entire log and in fact finish the entire log because you actually have enough time to cut from one side to another. But that's clearly absurd. Because if we took, take a, into account the nature of a Z series, what we soon see is that you'll never actually cut through the log because, as you can see, by, by nature of these divisions, they'll always converge towards one side, but they'll never actually cut across the line. So I don't think Ben Ardette's response works here. So how would I respond to the Zeno's paradoxes? Because we all know that we can move. I can move finite distances. And definitely, I disagree with the conclusion of this primary Zeno's paradox that movement cannot happen. So while it would be fallacious to argue that just because I don't like the conclusion, I have, that means that I could throw away the arguments, we have to respond to the arguments. So what's the best response to the arguments? In my opinion, the best response to these arguments is the idea that these, these deconstructions or these divisibilities do not actually go for infinity. While you might like to say you could conceptually devise them by infinity, it doesn't mean that there's physically an actually infinite number of divisions. Why? Well, it's actually quite simple because imagine we have a painting here for those chemists out there, and I'm not saying I'm a really good chemist, but we could see that this painting is broken down into paint molecules and those molecules into elements and those elements into atoms, and they could be deconstructed into these final quantum particles like the quarks which cannot be further deconstructed into further physical elements. So at the grounding of everything there's actually these indivisible things which although are conceptually divisible are not chemical or physically divisible. So we have each of these indivisible things so in fact there is no infinite thing we have to transverse, traverse 
but there's actually a finite things we have to traverse. So would that defeat Zeno's paradox? If it does, why did I raise it in the first place? Well, that's because I would like to raise the final iteration, the final variation of Zeno's paradox. Imagine you live in a universe. Well, we all do live in a universe, and that universe is according to the A theory of time, the dynamic theory of time, the idea that past and future are real phenomena. So when we live in an infinite theory of time, we soon realize that if the past was actually infinite, what, while we age, for example, on our first birthday, or the, our hundredth birthday, or thousandth birthday, if we live that long, the actually infinite past would stay exactly the same. The universe will always stay the same age, despite us aging within that universe. And that is, I think, well, quite absurd, because how could us age in a universe in which the universe does not mathematically age? And you might say, well, where am I getting this doesn't age from? Well, if we look at the Cantor's infinity or his arithmetic, what we do see is that a left null, an actually infinite number, plus n or any finite number is a left null. So any finite number when added to an transfinite number does not actually change. So we can see that while we are aging in an infinite universe, the infinite universe doesn't actually age. So that does seem to be absurd. And furthermore, imagine we have an infinite space around us, an actually infinite side to one side and an actually infinite all around us. Whether we move right or left, our coordinate will always be the same because when we look at coordinates, it's relative to a different point. For example, a uh, point five, seven on a graph would just be five from the X and seven from the Y. So what we can see is that each points or our coordinates are developed or based on the idea of finite spaces. So how does Bernard respond to this or this development of the Zeno's paradox? Well, basically what we do see is that Bernardet suggests that the entire world, although actually infinite, can be divisible into finite places. There are finite spaces in, in every part of a transfinite plane. But then that raises a problem. Since we cannot add up to infinity, it's absurd to suggest that the entirety of transfinite spaces are built out of finite parts, because if all parts of the finite or the universe are finite, it follows logically that the totality of the universe is finite because if you have finite numbers and you add to them, you will always get a finite number. So it seems that Zeno's paradox or this final variation of Zeno's paradox does seem to defeat the idea of an actually infinite past or an actually infinite surroundings. But what is the Grim Reaper's paradox that I raise? Well, the Grim Reaper's paradox is essentially the idea that imagine there's a guy at Fred. I'm sorry if your name's Fred because Fred well, kind of gets killed a lot in this paradox. Imagine a sentence. If Fred's dead or if, if Fred's alive at 12, then a Grim Reaper would kill him. If Fred's alive at 11.30, a Grim Reaper would spawn and kill him. So as you can see, what's happening here is that from 11 to 12, there has to be a time where the Grim Reaper kills him. As the Z series decreases, either a half an hour past 12, a quarter of an hour past 12, an eighth of an hour past 12, a Grim Reaper will kill him if he's not already dead. So we have this actually infinite series, this Z series, of P Grim Reaper spawning in to kill Fred ever since the bell struck at 11. So soon, if we follow this series, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. Well, is Fred alive or dead at the end of this series? Well, the answer is actually quite weird. He has to be dead because if he wasn't dead, something would have killed him. But at the same time, nothing actually had killed him because before each Grim Reaper could kill him, something before him must kill Fred already. So there's actually no definite Grim Reaper which kills Fred. So what do we conclude from this? I think we could conclude that it's impossible for us to have an actually infinite series of causes because if there was an actually infinite series of causes, there would not actually be any definite explanation for anything in the world around us or anything at all. So the series of causes in the past has to be finite. So now that we've concluded that causation has to be finite, space has to be finite, and time has to be finite, what implications do they have on the world around us? Well, I wouldn't talk too much about this unless I violate the rules of TEDx and I will start veering into the religious agenda thing. But if we accept this argument that I've raised, we soon realize that we are faced with a creatio or a existence ex nihilo. The universe came out of nothing because time or space cannot be 
infinite, and hence there must be a beginning to space. So, as an irreligious talk this is, I'll just leave you at that. You can find your own conclusions, but we're all faced with a creation out of nothing. I hope that you've liked everything, and I hope you've enjoyed this TED Talk. Hope you found it informative. If you want to learn more about the actual infinity, feel free to do any more research for yourself. I hope you have a good week. Stay safe, and thank you.